The passage tonight is Hebrews 7, 1 to 28. That's Hebrews 7, chap- oh, sorry, Hebrews 7, 1 to 28. For this, Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him. And to him, Abraham appointed a tenth part of everything. He is first by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. But resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. See how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who receive the priestly office have commandment have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these also are descended from Abraham." But this man, who does not have his descendant from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe, for which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah in the connection with the tribe Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of the instructable life, for it is witness of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced, through which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath, for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, But the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. We thank you, our Father, that tonight we listen to the living voice of your son from the throne room of heaven. 
We pray that as he addresses us, you would soften our hearts, that you would enable us to hear what he has to say, that we would hold fast to him and to draw near to him today and every day before our reaching of you in heaven. Amen. I'd be grateful if you would keep the passage open, whether you have a Bible or if you've got the sheets. And as we begin, I'd like us to turn to the immediate previous verse to this chapter, chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. This is what we looked at at the end of last week. Allow me to read what our author says. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. I want to ask you, do you have someone who's got your back? Is there someone in your life who will always be in your corner and never let you down? Do you have someone who will be forever for you, who is right now acting for you on your behalf? If tonight you are not yet a Christian, I have to say to you very sadly that the answer to that series of questions is no. Ultimately, no. But if tonight you are somebody who trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ, the answer is yes, emphatically yes. We've heard the author's introduction. Let me turn us to chapter 8, verse 1, which is his conclusion, gathering up everything he said in chapter, eight, in chapter 7. And this is the point God wants us to grasp. Chapter 8, verse 1. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, this kind of high priest, one who is seated in the heavenly place at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister, a servant in the holy places. Our author's passage tonight tells us this point. Right now, seated at the right hand of the throne of God in heaven is an all-powerful, everlasting ruler of the universe, but one who is at the same time unwaveringly, immovably, unendingly for you, who went to death for you, who rose to life for you, who is now exalted at the right hand of God the Father for you. And in this brief, pain-filled world, he is drawing you home. And he is serving you right now as your great high priest. Not some sinful, mortal, weak man like us, but Jesus, the Son of God, the one who is perfect and for you forever. If you are with us last week, we were told to put aside the milk bottle and start feeding on solid food so that we would grow up and we would not fall away. Well, tonight's passage is the filet mignon as it were, or corn burger, if you're into that kind of thing. And it should be delicious. God wants us to grasp that we have Jesus right now in heaven as our great high priest. And our passage explains to us why that is such a good thing. Verses 1 to 10, our author begins. He shows us that Melchizedek, who is the shadow into which Jesus stepped as the reality, was a far better kind of priest than any of the descendants of Levi given in the Old Testament law. Chapter 7, verse 1, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. These couple of sentences are a summary of Genesis chapter 14, 17 to 20. If you go back to that, you'll find that Abraham was on a journey back from a rescue mission. He'd got his nephew Lot with him and bags of plunder because he'd just killed a whole series of kings who'd kidnapped Lot, and he's on the road back home. And on the road, he's met by this figure, Melchizedek, 
I wonder what his nickname was at school. If he grew up in Australia, I'm sure it would have been Melko or something like that. Maybe East London, Mazedek, American, Z-Man or Z-Man, I don't know. However, the point is, we see him coming up to Abraham and he blesses him. And in response, Abraham gives him a tithe, a tenth of his treasure. And then just as soon as he appears, he's gone, off the scene without a trace. There for a moment, gone the next. And the narrative moves on. But through this brief encounter, Genesis 14 establishes something absolutely vital, that there is this thing, this thing called the priestly order of Melchizedek, to which the Lord Jesus belongs. And more than that, that this priest, Melchizedek, is far greater than Levi. And that is first because he is a king. Did you notice that in the text? Verse 1, this Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of the Most High God. Here is this figure who in the one person is not only just a priest, but at the same time a king. He has a royal priesthood. Our author goes on to explain that his name Melchizedek underlines that. Verse 2, he is first by translation of his name, king of righteousness. Melech in Hebrew, king. Zedek in Hebrew, righteousness. And this really matters. It matters because of the accusation that would have been flying around, being leveled at our original readers from their Jewish friends and family. You can imagine one of them getting a letter. Here it is from Granny. And this is what she says. My dear foolish child, why do you persist with this delusion? Have you not read the Torah? Your Jesus, he cannot deal with your sins. He's not a Levite. He's from the tribe of Judah, the kings. If you'd simply listened at yeshiva school, you'd have remembered what happened when a Jehudahite king like Uzziah tried to act as a priest. 2 Chronicles chapter 26, look it up. The Lord struck him down with leprosy and he died. King and priest do not mix, they're like oil and water. But our author comes back and says, no, 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 it is granny who's got it all wrong. No, there is an order of priesthood. That is an order of kingship. The royal priestly order of Melchizedek. He is a royal priest. But also he is a permanent priest. Chapter 7, verse 3. He, Melchizedek, is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. The point our author is making is this. Genesis makes no mention at all of Melchizedek's birth or his death. He simply appears on the scene, and then he's off the scene. And so, in terms of the text of Genesis, his priesthood is one that has no record of ending. It lasts forever. And in that sense, he foreshadows the priesthood of Jesus. Verse 3, Melchizedek resembled the Son of God as he continues a priest forever. The Son of God, who not only in literary terms but in actual fact we know, would live forever. So this priestly order of Melchizedek, a royal priesthood, a permanent priesthood, but also a perfect superior priesthood. And that is the logic of verses 4 to 10. I wonder if you'd look with me to verse 6. It recalls two facts about the meeting between Melchizedek and Abraham. Fact 1, Abraham gave Melchizedek a tithe. 10% of his treasure. Fact two, Melchizedek blessed Abraham. And our author's argument is that these two facts prove that Melchizedek was the superior to Abraham. Melchizedek's blessing of Abraham proves his superiority. Verse seven, it is beyond dispute that the inferior, Abraham, is blessed by the superior, Melchizedek. Our queen, when she does her work, confers her birthday honours on common citizens. It's not the other way around. The superior blesses the inferior. But also, verses 9 and 10, Abraham gave Melchizedek a tithe of his treasure, not the other way around. 
Verse 9, one might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham to Melchizedek. For he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. In biblical thinking, a descendant, all of the descendants of a person, are regarded as being contained in a person. So Levi, who was Abraham's great-grandson, even though he wasn't yet born, was there in Abraham's loins. I'll leave you to work out the details of that. But he was there, present. And the result is that through Abraham's act, paying tithes to Melchizedek, Levi was, as it were, doing the same thing, paying tithes to his superior. Again, proving that this king priest is better than Levi. If you didn't get all of those details, understand this, verses 1 to 10. When you line up Melchizedek and put him alongside Levi, it's like driving a Tesla Model X, or is that 10, Long Range Plus into the showroom and putting it up against a rusty 1920 Model T Ford. No comparison. The point is that the royal priestly order of Melchizedek exists. Not only does it exist, it is far superior to that of Levi. And that matters because Jesus belongs to the order of Melchizedek. Jesus was appointed in Psalm 110 verse 4, repeated in verse 17. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. I've got a few items here from my children's playroom. This is a starfish model, mode, shape, and, and a crab. And these are the things, the shapes into which the, the, the sand comes to form the substance. In verses 1 to 10, our author has been taking us through the shapes, and the shape was Melchizedek. Now what he turns to in verses 11 to 28 is the substance, what really matters. Verses 11 to 28, and that is the Lord Jesus, the one who has come as our permanent and perfect high priest. The first thing we need to recognize in these verses says our author, was that the coming of the Lord Jesus was necessary, absolutely necessary, because the old priest could not do the job. I can see only about two or three people in this room for whom this next illustration makes any sense. And that is that next Saturday at Twickenham is the Rugby Union Premiership Cup final. It's due to be played between Wasps, a team I follow, and Exeter. The fact that Wasps has qualified for the final is incredible, if you know anything about this season. They were once 10th in the premiership out of 12 back in February, and now they are in the final. And that has all happened because of a replacement of the coaching team. The old coach, Di Young, couldn't do the job. The new coach, Lee Blackett, has come in and he's made them qualify. That is obviously trivial, and I can see most of you are glazing over, but it's significant to me. <laughs> Something far more significant, far more real is happening in the coming of the Lord Jesus in the order of the priesthood of Melchizedek. He has come to replace a defunct priesthood that could not do the job, that could not make people qualify. Verse 11, now if perfection, qualification, had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, What further need would there be for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? The author is saying that if perfection, that is the cleansing of sin, which we desperately need, if that could have happened, if we could have been qualified through Levitical priests, then why is there the need for Jesus? But those sinful, mortal Levitical priests could not do the job that we needed. But we now have one who can do that job, who has come in a better and superior order, who provided a sacrifice of himself, not the mere blood of bulls and goats. And verse 12, because they needed replacing, the law that they presided over also needed replacing. You know that elections are happening now in the United States, And if Biden wins the election, there will be a new regime in America. And undoubtedly, he will bring a whole new raft of laws. And so it was with the regime change of the coming arrival of the Lord Jesus. Yes, verse 14, 
it's evident that our Lord, that is Jesus, was descended from Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses, the law said nothing about priests. But now, verse 12, the new regime has come and there's a change in the law. Ask one of the Levitical priests, prove your priesthood. He would roll out a big scroll of his ancestry showing that he descended from Levi. He'd give you a DNA test if there was one at the time. But that old law and that old basis has been superseded. Now there is a new qualification. The qualification of verse 16. Not a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but far better, the power of an indestructible life. When we ask Jesus, what is your qualification for priesthood? He doesn't roll out some DNA uh, into some family tree showing he descended from Levi. No, he holds up his wounds and he breathes his breath and he says, I'm alive. I have an indestructible life. Exactly as was promised by God in Psalm 110, quoted in verse 17. For it is witnessed of him, of the Lord Jesus, you are a priest forever, forever. An eternal priest, a living priest, after the order of Melchizedek. The Levites needed replacing because they could not do the job. Verse 18, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, such strong language. For the law made nothing perfect, but on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And that better high priest is the Lord Jesus, one who first is necessary, but also who is, who is permanent. I don't know about you, but in our family, we have four iPhones in the household at present. All of them are out of date, all of them being superseded by the new one, which I think is the iPhone 12 Pro. Is that what it's like with the priesthood? Is it that God is constantly updating to new models? What if the priesthood of Jesus is just going to be superseded like that of Levi? Well, our author anticipates that objection, and the answer comes in verse 20. And it was not without an oath. For those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. The Lord has sworn, says the psalm. When he promised that his coming king would come, he appointed him also as a great high priest and he swore with an oath that that would never change, that that was the permanent, final, ultimate state of affairs. And that is what happened when the Lord Jesus came. The Lord swore by an oath that this would be the everlasting, forever great high priest. Levi was always a temporary shadow. The blood of bulls and goats could never atone for sin. Only this one this great high priest in the order of Melchizedek, guaranteed by an oath by the God who cannot lie, has established this kind of king. Jesus' priesthood is permanent because of God's oath, but also, as the author has touched on before, because of his everlasting life. Verse 23, the former priests were many in number, priest after priest after priest, because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, the Lord Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. The old priesthood were like a series of old bangers, perhaps a student car, don't want to be offensive, but one that just keeps on spluttering out of action halfway down the M25. They never make it to the end because they kept on dying. They were many in number, because they were unable to do the job. Mortal, death-plagued, not eternal. But unlike every other priest, this priest is an everlasting priest, one who continues, verse 24, forever. And so he can act on our behalf forever. He is a permanent priest. But also, finally, as our author draws towards the end of his chapter, one who is perfect, necessary, 
permanent and perfect. One of the great problems of this pandemic is that so many of the doctors are themselves getting sick. They're, they're there to help us, but they themselves are weak. They themselves need help. And the same problem was there with the human weakness that plagued the Levitical priests. Their job was to represent us on our behalf before God, but they themselves were compromised. They were sick, sick with the disease of sin. They needed a sacrifice for their own sins and their own cleansing. So they could never provide proper sacrifice and cleansing for us. But not this king, not this priest. Verse 26. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest. Holy, innocent, unstained. Separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. In the Lord Jesus, we have one who uniquely, of all people who have ever lived, is holy, who is innocent, who is unstained. And he has provided once for all the sacrifice We need not the blood of bulls and goats, but his own blood. And he alone is perfect, as the author concludes in verse 28. For the law appointed men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, Psalm 110, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Now the point of what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest. We have such a high priest. You have such a high priest. Do you realize that? We can see why our author is so adamant that these hearers grasp it. If they didn't grasp this truth firmly, they didn't have it in their hearts then the shame and the suffering of being a follower of the Lord Jesus would be far too much. The battle with sin would be too wearying. They'd lose their grip of Jesus. They'd fall away. And they'd be left depending on their old priests. And the same goes for us. The same goes for us. If we don't understand this and know this, that we have such a great high priest, we'll lose our grip on Jesus we'll fall back. And like them, we'll be left depending on mere mortal men. Because everybody has to depend on someone. If not on Jesus, you will depend on somebody else, a human being. Whether that's a friend that you go to in times of crisis, whether it's a parent that you rely on, whether it's the boss, or a vicar, or yourself. All of them, hopeless, weak, even the best of them stained with their own sin. Even the very best of them inevitably spluttering out because of their own deaths. But not you. You have such a high priest. Not a sinful, mortal man, but you have the Son of God. You have God who took on flesh and blood for you. You have the one who was put to test in every way as we are, but unlike us, did not give in to Satan. You have one who, out of love for you and your sake, chose a pain-filled path of obedience instead of a self-preserving path of sin. You have one who, like clay in a furnace, has been shaped and proven and made perfect through his life. You have the only one who is worthy to act on your behalf with God. You have one whose sacrifice of himself has purified you, and as we'll read later, has made you perfect in God's sight and qualified you to draw near. You have have one who is at his resurrection exalted and appointed a universal king 
but at the same time, your great high priest in the order of Melchizedek. You have one who has gone as a forerunner into heaven, who is there right now for you. What is he doing? Verse 25 is so precious. He is there interceding for you. Interceding, which is to act on your behalf before God. That is what priests do. We began at the beginning of our talk asking the question, do you have somebody who's got your back in this life? Do you know that you've got someone in your life who will never let you down? Do you have in your life someone who is for you and on your behalf unwaveringly and forever? And the answer, if you are a Christian tonight, is yes, you do. You see, Jesus didn't just fold up his arms and stop serving you when he died on the cross. He didn't say, there's my sacrifice, good luck, all the best. No, right now. And moment by moment, he is appealing to God the Father on your behalf on the basis of his perfect, wrath-bearing sacrifice for all of your sins. On this journey to heaven, do you hear Satan's accusations? I do. Do you feel your weakness as you wake up to face another day? Do you see your sin? Not just the obvious ones, the secret ones that only you know and God knows. Well, to you, God says, you have such a great high priest. Every word and every deed, the things we ought to have done and the things we ought not to have done, all of them at every moment purified, cleansed, washed white by the blood of our great high priest in heaven who is interceding, pleading for us before the throne of God. The author Calvin puts it this way, the son turns the father's eyes to his own righteousness to avert his gaze from our sins. He so reconciles the Father's heart to us that by his intercession, he prepares a way and access to the Father's throne. God's message to us tonight is that you have such a great high priest, one who is for you, one who is now on your behalf interceding for you for your sin, one who has got your back, one who is always in your corner. And he is there as our forerunner, and he is pulling us home every single moment of our lives through the storm of this life. And as we grasp that, if we know that, it will give us strong encouragement, as our author said last week, to hold fast. Hold fast, which is a strange term. It means to grip, grip hard, to hold on to the rope of the Lord Jesus drawing us home to him. If we know that, we will hold fast. And if we know that, we'll do the other thing this passage keeps on encouraging us to do. Verse 19, verse 25, to draw near with confidence, confidence, draw near to him. Every moment from now until we see him face to face. Why don't we do that right now in prayer? You have such a high priest. We thank you, our Father, that right now in the throne room of heaven, we have the perfect Son of God interceding for us on our behalf. We pray that this truth would be lodged into our minds and our hearts, that every day we would be encouraged to hold fast to him and that we would be drawing near to him, to his throne of grace. And we pray it for Jesus' sake. Amen.